As the 1997-1998 NBA season got underway, the Golden State Warriors were absolutely lost. Nine games into the season, the Warriors were still searching for their first win. And as the losses mounted, so too did the tension, particularly between the team's best player and its newly hired head coach. And barely a month into the campaign, that escalating animosity culminated in a shocking episode of violence that not only further humiliated an already scuffling franchise, but ultimately defined the career of an otherwise decorated four-time All-Star. Long before his infamous imbroglio with his head coach in 1997, Latrell Sprewell's volatility was well known across the NBA, and it was something his Golden State Warriors teammates discovered especially quickly. In 1993, not long after turning pro, Sprewell famously uncorked a barrage of punches at teammate Byron Houston after the power forward elbowed him during practice. Sprewell was undeterred by the fact that Houston was roughly 60 pounds heavier than him. Then, in 1995, Sprewell got into a fight with teammate Jerome Kersey during a scrimmage, a scrap that Sprewell unequivocally lost. He left the gym in a huff, only to return minutes later wielding a 2x4. Luckily for Kersey, teammates Joe Smith and Chris Gatling, both 6'10 and roughly 225 pounds, stepped in at that point to restrain Sprewell. He was a loose cannon without a doubt, but he could also ball. Selected 24th overall in the 1992 draft following an impressive run at Alabama, Sprewell cracked the Warriors starting lineup as a rookie and immediately established himself as a key building block for the franchise. In 92-93, Sprewell averaged more than 15 points and nearly 4 assists per game, earning a spot on the all-rookie second team. Then, as a sophomore, Sprewell earned an All-NBA selection and All-Defensive second team honor after averaging 21 points, 4.7 assists, and 2.2 steals per game while leading the league in minutes. In just his second NBA season, Sprewell started all 82 regular season contests for the Warriors, helped lead them back to the playoffs, and was seemingly blossoming into one of the league's best shooting guards. That brilliance on the court made it easier for the Warriors to overlook Sprewell's combustibility, especially after Golden State essentially picked him to be their guy. After all, throughout the early to mid-1990s, the Warriors accumulated a bevy of promising young players to potentially build around in addition to Sprewell. Tim Hardaway, Chris Webber, Tom Gugliotta, Billy Owens. Before long, however, all of them were traded away and the Warriors settled into a profound mediocrity, with Sprewell as their lone bright spot. But they were nothing if not committed to him. In 1996, his checkered history notwithstanding, Sprewell was named team captain by newly hired head coach Rick Edelman. Months later, the organization signed Sprewell to a four-year, $32 million contract that made him one of the highest paid guards in the league. If the Warriors were going to reverse their fortunes in the decade's second half, it was going to be with Latrell Sprewell leading the charge. Or so they thought. In 1997, the Warriors fired Edelman and replaced him with P.J. Carlissimo, a notoriously stern head coach with a disciplinarian bent. In fact, during his three-year stint as head coach of the Portland Trail Blazers, he reportedly earned the nickname Polissimo. And, as the court documents eventually put it, relations between the Warriors' austere new head coach and their temperamental star quickly deteriorated. Which party bears responsibility for that breakdown ultimately depends on who you ask, but basically Sprewell felt that Carlissimo quickly started riding him, and even scapegoated him, for the Warriors' miserable start in 97-98, while Carlissimo felt that his team's best player grew impudent and unprofessional as the losses started piling up. In any event, the tension between the two was abundantly clear, and the situation quickly became untenable enough for Sprewell to request a trade less than a month into the season. However, before a deal could be finalized, their escalating tension boiled over in one of the most infamous and violent episodes in NBA history. During a fateful practice on December 1st, 1997, with the Warriors mired at 1-13 for the season, Carlissimo took issue with Sprewell's passing. As then Warriors point guard Bimbo Coles explained years later, Carlissimo was telling him he wasn't throwing his passes hard enough. Coles added, it's embarrassing when a coach does that to you. Carlissimo, however, kept on riding Sprewell, who eventually turned around, slammed the ball into the floor, and without sparing the expletives, told his coach to get off his back. That didn't help defuse the situation. Instead, Carlissimo and Sprewell kept jawing at each other. And then, in the heat of the moment, 
Sprewell committed the act of violence that would define his career and ultimately obscure an otherwise impressive NBA resume. Following the exchange of invective, Sprewell lunged at Carlissimo, put his hands around his neck, and threatened to kill him. According to court documents, Carlissimo offered no resistance. According to New York Magazine, Carlissimo told Sprewell, do it. So, Sprewell didn't let go of his coach's neck choking him for 7 to 10 seconds before teammates and coaches managed to pull him off of Carlissimo. Sprewell then grumbled his way out of the gym, barking out a request for a trade as he made his way off the floor, but he wasn't done with Carlissimo just yet. About 20 minutes later, after showering and changing, Sprewell returned to the gym and attacked Carlissimo again, grazing his coach's cheek with an overhand punch before being restrained by his teammates. It was a shocking, unprecedented incident, one that further humiliated the already pathetic Warriors and quickly sent shockwaves through the basketball world. When Carlissimo met with reporters after practice, the scratches on his neck raised eyebrows. Soon enough, he and Warriors GM Gary St. Jean were behind a phalanx of cameras and microphones answering questions. The cap was out of the bag. And so began not only an acrimonious divorce between Sprewell and the Warriors, but broader nationwide conversations about labor management issues and the complex relational dynamics of a league comprised of predominantly black players and predominantly white coaches. Almost immediately following the incident, Golden State suspended Sprewell without pay for 10 games. But as public outrage towards Sprewell grew, the Warriors went considerably farther in their punishment and voided Sprewell's contract marking the first time in league history that a player's contract was voided for insubordination. Meanwhile, the NBA also came down hard on Sprewell, handing him a year-long suspension, then the longest in league history, barely 12 hours after the Warriors terminated his contract. And to add insult to injury, Sprewell was also dropped as a spokesperson by Converse. However, Sprewell, who expressed remorse after the incident and maintained that Carlissimo's mounting verbal abuse had led to his blow-up, wasn't about to have his career derailed without a fight. In the wake of his two unprecedented punishments, Sprewell and the NBPA filed grievances against both the Warriors and the NBA. Sprewell may not have had robust support in the court of public opinion, but in the end, after hearing testimony from 21 different witnesses, accepting over 50 exhibits, and receiving over 300 pages of pre- and post-hearing briefs, an independent arbitrator ruled in Sprewell's favor. He found that the termination of Sprewell's contract by the Warriors was not supported by just cause and ordered Golden State to reinstate him. He also ruled that Sprewell's year-long suspension from the NBA be reduced to 68 games, allowing Sprewell to return for the start of the 98-99 campaign. It was a career-saving ruling for Sprewell and a mammoth victory for players' rights advocates, though, predictably, it wasn't received well by NBA Commissioner David Stern. As he put it, you can't choke your boss and keep your job unless you work in the NBA. That said, despite having the two years and roughly $24 million remaining on his contract reinstated, Sprewell's reputation was permanently tarnished. He was forever cast as a villain, and his PR efforts following the incident didn't really help in that regard. I wasn't choking PJ. I mean, PJ, he could breathe. It's not like he was losing air or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't a choke. I wasn't trying to uh, kill PJ. You were out of control. Well, um, I will say that, you know, I, I, you know, I was upset and I, I did lose control to a certain degree, but I didn't lose total control. And, it goes without saying, his days in Golden State were over. In January of 1999, with the lockout-shortened season about to commence, the Warriors traded Sprewell to the New York Knicks for John Starks, Chris Mills, and Terry Cummings. At that point, Sprewell was roughly 13 months removed from his last NBA game, but the Knicks were willing to take a shot on the then three-time All-Star, and he rewarded their faith in him by helping New York to three playoff appearances and an NBA Finals berth in his largely successful five-year run with the club. Meanwhile, absent their best player and ostensible franchise cornerstone, the Warriors somehow faded even farther into irrelevance. They finished with a staggering 19-63 record in 97-98 and didn't even threaten for another playoff berth until after Sprewell was out of the league. Carlissimo, incidentally, lasted less than three seasons with the Warriors, getting fired midway through the 1999-2000 campaign with a cumulative 46-113 record with Golden State. 
Roughly a quarter century later as it happens, the Warriors are one of the NBA's most respected franchises, having captured more NBA championships since the turn of the century than every other team except the Los Angeles Lakers and San Antonio Spurs. But their recent triumphs haven't erased the memories of that regrettable day from 1997, an ugly episode that epitomized the franchise's woes at the time and defined the 13-year career of the Trail Sprewell. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, hit that subscribe button.